In this video, we're going to talk about optical activity. Optical activity involves the concept of plane polarized light. Now, light has both a component electric field and a component magnetic field. And normally, it's kind of oscillating in all different directions. So instead of going in a bunch of different directions, we want the light to be polarized in one direction. In this particular picture, this is representing the direction that the electric field is polarized in. You can see that it's polarized in the vertical direction. So in this picture, you can see that we have a light source. And as I said, ordinary light oscillates in all sorts of different directions. And what the polarizer does is it has these little slits that only allows light whose electric field oscillates in this particular plane to go through. And then we only have the light plane polarizer pointed in one direction. If you have a sample tube containing an achiral compound, the plane polarized light will go through it and come out the same way. Thus, we say that achiral compounds are optically inactive. However, if you have a chiral compound, it will rotate plane polarized light. And that's what you're seeing here. So here's that polarized light over there. That light went through a polarizer to get it to line up in one direction. Here's our sample tube. And in that sample tube, you would put your compound. And if your compound is chiral, then it will cause the light to rotate just a little bit here. So we say that chiral compounds do rotate plane polarized light. And so chiral compounds are optically active. The amount of rotation that occurs is going to vary for different compounds. What we find is that if we have a pair of enantiomers, they will rotate in equal and opposite directions. So the amount of rotation is measured as observed specific rotation, or alpha d. And if it's negative, that means that the compound is rotating the light in the counterclockwise direction. And if it's positive, that means it's rotating in the clockwise direction. Keep in mind that if you have a mixture of enantiomers, then you will not rotate plane polarized light. Because if one enantiomer rotates clockwise and the other enantiomer rotates counterclockwise, then they will cancel each other out. So we can only get optical rotation if we have either a pure enantiomer or more of one enantiomer than the other in the mixture. The term dextrorotatory refers to clockwise rotation of light in the positive direction. And the term levorotatory refers to counterclockwise rotation or rotation in the negative direction. We have two examples here. You can see lactic acid. This enantiomer of lactic acid rotates in the positive direction or clockwise, so it is dextrorotatory. This enantiomer of lactic acid rotates light in the negative direction or counterclockwise, so it is levorotatory. The term enantiomeric excess refers to the excess percentage of one enantiomer over the other. This term is a little bit confusing because it does not refer to relative amounts of enantiomers, but rather the excess of one enantiomer over the other. You can calculate enantiomeric excess based on your observed specific rotation. If we know the specific rotation of the pure enantiomer, we can measure the observed specific rotation of the mixture, divide by the specific rotation of the pure enantiomer, multiply by 100%, and that will give us an antiomeric excess. Let's use these compounds here as an example. Let's say you have an observed specific rotation of plus five. Well, we're going to take our observed specific rotation, divide by the specific rotation of the pure enantiomer, which is 5.75, and multiply by 100%. This would give you 87% an antiomeric excess. What if you know your amounts of enantiomers and you want to try to calculate enantiomeric excess? Well, all we need to do is take the amount of the greater enantiomer, subtract by the amount of the lesser enantiomer, and divide over the total amount of both enantiomers. For example, if we have 3 grams of the greater enantiomer and 2 grams of the lesser enantiomer, I would take 3 grams, subtract 2 grams, and divide over 5 grams. Multiply that by 100% to get 20% EE. If you, all you know is percentages, you should still be able to calculate the enantiomeric excess. For example, a racemic mixture has an EE of 0%, which makes sense because in this case you would have 50% of one enantiomer and 50% of the other. So if we subtract these numbers, you would get 0% EE. Here's another example. 
if you have 75% of one enantiomer and 25% of another, you would get an EE of 50%. These examples also make sense with the top equation because if you had five grams of one enantiomer and five grams of the other, you would get an EE of 0%. Or if you had three grams of one enantiomer and one gram of the other, that would give you an EE of 50%. This concludes the video on optical activity. In the next video, we're going to talk about Fisher projections and relate what we learned about optical activity to carbohydrates.